welcome everyone to our first uh, of our selected presentations for this morning. Uh, if you're coming in, please do quickly find a seat. It's my absolute pleasure this morning to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Michael Cordova. Michael is a software engineer at Etsy. Last year, he was a lawyer working in intellectual property, privacy and administrative law. He lives in New York City, but he, lives his ho he lists his hometown as Hobart on Facebook. Michael grew up in the early days of the internet, and he's seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of an unregulated environment. He has a particular interest in the challenges that exist at the intersection of technology, community, and the law. Much to his relief, Michael has been found not to be vexatious, under the Freedom of Information Act. <laughs> Michael will be taking questions at the end of the session, so if you do have questions, please keep them until the end of the session and you'll have an opportunity to ask them again, and uh, to ask them at that point. Please join me in welcoming Michael Cordova. Thank you very much, Cathy. Um, I want to start by paying respects to the traditional and original owners of the land uh, on which we meet today, the Moonina people, and to pay respect to those that have passed before us and to acknowledge Tasma today's Tasmanian Aboriginal community who are the custodians of this land. Um, I also just want to say that it's really heartwarming to see so many people here and so many people I greatly respect here. I'm uh, really excited to, to talk and I hope that it lives up to your expectations. Um, so who am I? Uh, I am, I'll let you decide which of these is me and which of these is inner me. Uh, I'm an Australian lawyer and an American programmer. I'm not a legal practitioner. I don't have a right to practice anywhere in the world at the moment. Uh, and I'm not going to be providing legal advice, obviously. Um, I work for Etsy, as Cathy mentioned, but uh, I'm not representing them here. Uh, these are my views and not Etsy's views. Uh, having said that, Etsy is a great company. If you want to talk about them, I'm happy to talk about them. If you want a job, come chat to me. Um, but uh, uh, that's not what I'm doing here today. I'll be talking about privacy. I like Haskell. Um, I really enjoy programming in Haskell. I like PHP, and I really enjoy programming in PHP. So uh, I am a man of opposites, if nothing else. I contain multitudes. Um, I want to begin by going through a little bit of history about what privacy means. The idea that we have some right to privacy is actually relatively recent in terms of legal history. Uh, the original rights can be traced back probably to uh, the late part of the 19th century with the idea that people have a right to be let alone. Uh, and that right was embodied in the US Constitution in the Bill of Rights in the Fourth Amendment, which provides security of a person's personal effects and papers. Um, and we talk about these original privacy rights as being a right to solitude and a right to secrecy. And so it's this idea that people should have freedom from being interfered with by people they don't want near them, by people they don't want to, uh, to be talking to them or to be looking at the stuff that they want to keep secret. Technology created a little bit of a shift in the way that we think about privacy, and these days privacy rights extend to uh, some newer ideas like anonymity and the right to be forgotten. These are very important ideas and are designed to preserve some of the same things uh, as those earlier ideas of privacy were designed to look at. Anonymity is all about a right to be able to do things even in the public sphere, without those things necessarily being associated with your identity. So you can see that that's similar in a way to the right to be let alone or the right to solitude or to uh, exist independently of people uh, talking about you or interfering with you. Uh, and the right to be forgotten similarly is, is a right where we talk about people's, um, people's rights to participate in public discourse, to participate uh, in the world, but then have that information uh, cease to exist when they cease to participate. These are rights that only became necessary because of the great expansion in technology that we've seen over the last 100 years, and indeed, uh, they've become much more important in the last 20 years. Uh, the, for example, the idea of a right to be forgotten really relies on the existence of things that are going to remember who it is that you are and what it is that you're doing. 
uh, those types of technologies did not exist in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. We didn't have uh, things like video and audio recording uh, in even the early part of the 20th century. So over the last 100 years, these uh, huge changes in technology have resulted in a need for uh, new ways of recognising the way they can be used to interfere with individuals. And this is really going to be the key theme that I'm talking about today, is that the world is not as it once was. The idea that we uh, should be building incrementally on the things that we're doing uh, is really not sufficient to look at, uh, to, to, to preserve the things that we want uh, in the modern world. Uh, so if we look at where the law went wrong, well, technology moves quickly. There have been a lot of really significant changes that have happened. And it turns out that the things that the law is designed to protect, things like an association between information about you and your name being held by someone you don't know, are actually no longer that important. What I've got here is a little screenshot um, that I took this morning when I went to my.gov.au um, and looked at the cookies that were set. The ones I've blurred out are the ones that were set to the same values even when I returned to the site after clearing my cookies. So, this is the type of tracking that we have. I wasn't logged in, this wasn't associated with my identity, but all of a sudden, I'm a GUID. I am some number, and you can see already that there are at least two different types of tracking uh, being done there, and that is sufficient to identify me. And all of a sudden, this idea that personal information that needs protection, that the right to privacy exists around your right to disassociate your name from your actions, doesn't really make sense. Because it's not about your name, it's about your identifier. And that identifier may not be about uh, who you are legally, it may just be connected to who you are reputationally on the internet. I go by the moniker Majek or Mjek on the internet, uh, that is quite closely connected to my name, but that is sufficient to identify me even if it's not connected to my legal identity. And what this is actually about is creating a social reputation system. That's what a name really is. It is how we identify you in disparate contexts. And so that social reputation system continues to exist on the internet. And where information is associated with your reputation, that, I think, is where we need to be thinking about privacy. And that can happen even in reputation systems that you don't see. If Google Analytics thinks that they have some profile on you and that is associated solely with some unique identifier, that's sufficient to be the type of reputation system I think we need to be concerned about. Conversely, I don't think we need to be concerned about clout. <laughs> Thank you for the pity laughs. Um, the law also created this idea that we can consent to people interfering with our privacy. And that's absolutely true. There is no doubt that there are some things people do in private that they are willing to have some people see but not other people see. And this idea of consent lies at the core of the way the law deals with questions like privacy and, and questions about rights. The problem is that consent isn't really a well understood thing in this context. We'd normally talk about consent being informed, consent requiring some understanding of the nature and character of the thing you're consenting to. And for the vast majority of the world's population, there's not that understanding of the nature and character of the things being consented to. And even this uh, screenshot comes from cookielaw.org, because I was thinking about the cookie law, uh, that the EU has implemented, which says people should be able to opt out of having tracking cookies. But that's really meaningless. If you think about the way that, tracking, that information tracking is done in the modern world, it's not about a single cookie that tracks your behaviour. It's about the way that we aggregate data and large data sets, and we use data in ways that are not envisaged by the average person on the street. So I think that this, I, this question of do you consent to the use of your information in this way, doesn't really reflect the reality of uh, the way that the information is used. Nobody understands or can be expected to understand exactly the way that every company uses personal information and builds reputation trees and feeds your information into neural networks and feeds your information into models. That, in, that 
use of information is phone to the vast majority of people. Maybe not the vast majority of people in this room, but the vast majority of people in the world. Consent also requires that you are making some conscious decision to agree, that you're making that decision before the information collection begins to occur. And that's just not the way the web is structured. You can't, uh, get in, you can't understand what's going to happen before you visit the website because you know, there's already been an exchange of HTTP headers at the very least. You need to be able to unagree for consent to be valid. You have to be able to say, actually, I no longer consent to my information being used in this way. But where your information is being mixed and aggregated, where profiles are being built about you, it may not be possible to disaggregate some of your behaviour from these broader models. So it might not be possible for you to be forgotten. And that's a real challenge that the European Union's right to be forgotten law has posed to a huge number of internet companies. So I think that this idea that people are going to just be able to make some rational trade-off about whether they permit their information to be used in one way or another before they start using a website or a service uh, just doesn't reflect the way the world really works. The consent that, people, that companies purport to have to use people's information is not true consent in any sense of the word. I'd like to give a quick example under the current law of how privacy policies work. So this is an example, uh, not from the first website that I went to, which I couldn't find a privacy policy on. Um, that was the LCA website. The <laughs> not from the second website I went to, which also didn't have a privacy policy, and that was the Linux Australia website. <laughs> But this is from the third website I went to, which is the GovHack website, which is also run by Linux Australia. And it says, any personal information you choose to provide will only be used for the purpose for which it was provided and will not be disclosed to other persons or organisations without your prior consent or as required by law. That is boilerplate text, so I thought I would Google it. And it turns out that there are hundreds of other organisations that use those exact words. And do you think the way that the Cairns Botanic Garden uses your personal information is similar to the way that the Chief Minister uh, for Treasury and Economic Development uses your personal information in the ACT? Do you think that uh, the way the uh, Hazelbrook Legal Service uses your information is the same as the way that GovHack uses your information? It's obviously not. And I'm not here trying to criticise GovHack or LA or LCA. I'm not criticising these privacy policies. I have written some of these privacy policies. Not this one, but you know, I, I have written privacy policies for organisations. And this is what you have to do. Because to try to describe the precise way that information will be used is extraordinarily difficult. And people... Uh, and there's actually a requirement in Australian law that your privacy policy be easy to read. Well, how easy can it be to read if you first have to explain the concept of you know, a, uh, a neural network to someone to explain that their information is going to be fed into a neural network to develop a personal model for uh, you know, their likes and dislikes? It's not really possible, I think, to provide that level of detail in these type of privacy documents. And the consequence is that nobody cares what the privacy policy says. Nobody goes out and looks for privacy policies to read. Even I don't go and look for privacy policies to read. Uh, there was a survey done uh, by the Global Privacy Enforcement Network in 2014. They did a, a scan of mobile applications because they thought mobile device privacy is important. Um, and it certainly is. Uh, they discovered that 70% of the apps they surveyed had no privacy information available before you installed the application. And at that stage, that was before you had Android providing uh, um, permissions at the time that the permission was first used. It was you had to provide permissions to the application on install, and then you would be able to see how they would be using your information. This model just doesn't work. People don't have privacy policies, people don't care about privacy policies, and even the best privacy policies don't provide the information that would be genuinely required for people to make a decision about whether to permit their information to be used in that way. And even if they did, it doesn't matter. I know this stuff, I care about this stuff, I have Google location services turned on. 
I have Google location history turned on because I like to sit there and see what was I doing on December 23rd, 2016. It's like looking through old photographs to see exact GPS coordinates of everywhere I've been in my life. It's super creepy, but it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the real conflict that we face in this field, that people like the services that are being provided, and those services couldn't be provided in the absence of this type of pervasive bulk data collection. But that still poses a problem. It still poses a risk to our right to be free from interference. Because I have this turned on and I know, and I have made that conscious decision. And I know if I ever need to run away from someone, I should drop my phone. My mother has this turned on and has not made that conscious decision. She was asked, do you want location services to be enabled? And there's a big yes and a little no. And so she taps yes. She only discovered the other day, and I'm sorry, dear mother, that Android has multiple screens you can swipe through. She thought there was just one home screen. That is the experience of the vast majority of people, is they're not paying deep attention to these questions. They're saying, hey, here's a cool thing I can use. They're saying, hey, all of my friends have signed up for Facebook or Snapchat or whatever else, and therefore I should too that if everybody else does it, it can't possibly be that bad. And I think I don't have to explain to the people in this room or the people watching this stream exactly why it is that is bad. Because this is a screenshot that I picked out that's okay for public consumption. But the one on the day before included my visit to a doctor. And it showed the location of the doctor's office that I went to, and you can Google that and see the specialty that they provide. And all of a sudden, this information, which was perhaps just about you know, automatic uh, snapshots of where I've been in the world, turns into automatic snapshots of my health history. And that's very invasive. And I don't think Google is, you know, people at Google aren't sitting there browsing through people's location history for fun. But that information is accessible to governments. And it's always going to be accessible to governments because the governments control you know, the police and the army and the people who, if you say no, will come in and take your servers by force. And that's the danger, is that that can happen. And <coughs> there are some people who say, oh, look, it's fine. We're moving to a post-state world where corporations will have this control instead of governments. And the problem isn't that government has control. It's that control is centralised. And that centralisation of control poses the same risk of abuse whether the person in charge is Barack Obama or Donald Trump or Mussolini. That's just the stuff we see. I've singled out TapAd here because uh, it's easy to single them out, but there are lots of services that take and aggregate anonymous or pseudo-anonymous data in order to build profiles of people, predominantly for advertising purposes. TapAd is able to do cross-device attribution. That's really exciting, and the technology is super cool. I saw a version of the talk that this slide comes from, and there's some fascinating computer science in it. But what they're doing is actually incredibly invasive. It's saying that I think the person using this, this telephone is the same person using this desktop computer, and we can link those two profiles together with some degree of certainty. And that's invasive even when they don't get it wrong. And they only get it right about 70% of the time. And that's harmful even in the perfect world where that information is only used for the most benevolent of purposes because it is per se an interference with the individual because we have a right to be left alone. And that right was implicit for the vast majority of human history. But over the last two decades, we have seen that right slowly be chipped away by new technology. And that is, I think, a real problem. And that's just non-state actors. There are plenty of government actors that are collecting huge amounts of information and correlating huge data sets. And sometimes that's for the greater good, and sometimes it's not. 
And the problem is that we don't have these matters considered on balance every time. We have bulk data collection, where the government says, we want the right to collect everything, or we won't have anything at all. We've moved from a time where, because of technological limitations, you could only surveil one person at a time, or you could only you know, get a warrant for one person's house at a time, because it takes actual humans to go in there and break down the door and rifle through the papers. But when it doesn't take actual humans, when you can just collect and process huge quantities of data, that becomes much easier to say, okay, we'll just take everything then. We'll just interfere with everyone's privacy, and we probably won't look at it unless there's a real problem. That's not free from being left alone. And there's no good solution to this. As I said, there's, it's very hard to get infrastructure that is independent of any kind of government control. It's very hard to uh, be immune from the law. And there are, has been great work done by a whole range of companies fighting against everything from DMCA requests and national security letters to uh, working hard on actual policy proposals to improve freedom on the internet and to reduce uh, the degree of interference with privacy. But at the end of the day, the person who makes the law still has control. And even when companies decide they're no longer going to trade in China because they don't like government in China, that's actually not protecting us from the interferences that are possible in the other 194 countries in the world. So this risk is not limited to companies or businesses or people with whom you make contracts uh, engaging in, uh, in this type of behavior. It also exists in government. So the natural question from here is what do we do? Thank you, Michael. You've pointed out all the horrible things in the world. <laughs> How are we going to solve that problem? I proposed this talk six months ago, and on Monday I came up with an answer. <laughs> and on Tuesday I heard Piers talk and had to change my answer. <laughs> so there are a whole bunch of things that we can do. Um, we heard this morning about having people own their own data, and that's really powerful. It means that people have absolute control over how they do things. But in a, in a practical way, owning your own data is a really hard uh, thing to do. You could uh, email data to people and hope that they email it back or that it continues to uh, be under their control. IP Australia has this system where when you have a half-finished trademark application, you can download a zip file and then re-upload that later in order to resume your application. Um, but that zip file is proprietary and encrypted and only valid for 14 days. Um, so it's not really clear why they do that in the first place. You could be Bitcoin, <laughs> you know. You could say that everybody has to have a full copy of all of the encrypted data available, and that way we can ensure that everybody has control of their own data, but there's enough redundancy that it continue to operate. But these are not convenient ways of dealing with the internet. If I, uh, you know, tell a friend of mine that I've got this great service that you can sign up for, it's a beautiful social networking service, all you have to do is put a server in your basement and then like install Linux and then install pump.io and then you'll be able to access it and it's just like Twitter. It'll be like, why am I not using Twitter? As these services are centralized for a reason and that reason is sometimes about network effects and first to market monopolies, but it's often about convenience. It's about the fact that it is much easier for everyone to use these remotely hosted services than to use self-hosted services. And as long as those services are provided for free, and even when they're provided at a cost, that stuff is, is just much easier than trying to run these services yourself. And if you're not running the service yourself, you don't control the data. And if you don't control the data, that data can be subject to all sorts of uh, alternate uh, alternate uses. And we see this in the terms of service of all sorts of web services, where you're being asked to provide copyright licenses that are perpetual and irrevocable so that they can use that information uh, 
and, and republish that information. But also so that they can perform statistical analyses, so that they can share data with their partners when it will make the service better for you, uh, for whatever that means. So, here are some great ideas that we can do. Open systems, right? That's obviously the solution. We have open systems, we have decentralization, we have federated systems where uh, you know, programs can talk to each other over open protocols. You have the, uh, you know, open social system. You have XMPP. You have these technical standards which can solve these problems, where you can give explicit consent to particular data being used in particular ways, where you can share parts of your information in order to gain these services, and you can make services non-permissive by default. So that's to say that you don't get, Facebook doesn't get to say, oh, here's how we're going to use your information, and it's going to be these 10,000 different ways. If we decentralize, we can say, OK, I really like having a history of my location everywhere, so I'll get an app that just does that. And that's all it does, and my location information isn't used in order to build an advertising profile on me as well. So that... Uh, is really, I think, a symptom of this. Sites do too much stuff. Every service does too much stuff. And part of the too much stuff they do is stuff that you can't even see. It's the, uh, it, it, it's the advertising, it's the, um, it, it's the building of, uh, of profiles and information in order to improve services. And this is done for genuine and laudable commercial goals, but in being done, it is, uh, compromising our right to privacy. I think that this is the Unix philosophy, right? Do one thing and do it well. Make things able to be piped together and grouped together so that people can do exactly what they want. But here's what that really means. If we want to say that services like Facebook can't exist uh, and can't be do everything by default, if we say that the web shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to collect this information without informed consent on every part of the information that you're going to be collecting, that means we ban Google Analytics. It means we ban Facebook. It means we stop doing digital government by default. It means we go back 20 years and the web, which was a great system for clients downloading hypertext from servers, that's now changed. We now have this interactive system. And all of the protocols that went along with that have disappeared in favour of port 80, or now port 443, which is much better. But the web has become what the internet was meant to be. Everything is now done through web services. And I don't see a way that, short of going back to 1997 and deciding, well, actually, we don't want the web to become this monolith of centralised control, it's very hard to get people to download bespoke software to do their communication. Nobody uses ICQ anymore. Nobody uses IRC except that one guy. <laughs> uh, that's the problem, is that we've already made this step. Pierre was saying that we need to be making conscious choices, and I think that's absolutely right. The problem that I see is we've already made those choices. We decided that we wanted the internet to uh, exist primarily on the web. We wanted a way to run applications lightweight and sandboxed on clients' computers, so we had JavaScript. We wanted a way to encourage interactivity in a way that was easy, that didn't involve downloading complicated software for every service that you wanted to interact with. And so we got this great open standardized system. We got Web 2.0, and it has done wonders for the world. The ease of communication now, the ease of participation in democracy, the ease of submitting government forms, all of these things are great uh, advances that couldn't have happened without this. We've seen the expansion in the availability of government and public sector data. We've seen the expansion in the availability of information in a way that was virtually inconceivable decades ago. When Douglas Adams wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, that was an absurd fiction. 
and now Wikipedia is in everyone's pocket and also on my watch. <laughs> that is fantastic. But the cost of that has been this idea that is only very recent to begin with, that we have some right to freedom from interference. That doesn't really exist anymore. Because by participating in the web, you have to participate in all of these things. You have to run JavaScript. You have to enable third-party cookies. And even if you don't have to do all of those things, you still have to trust your data to some server-side provider. And those services still get to use your data in these ways that may end up being creepy, that might correlate your information with another device user or another person in your household. So that's not particularly hopeful. What can we do about this? Well, we can try to change it. And we have been trying to change it. The open source community has been trying to force GPJ on everyone for decades. <laughs> the problem is people aren't interested. People don't see an immediate impact on themselves. They don't see the cost. And even when you sit down and explain to them all of the creepy things that are happening, even with Snowden revelations about the way that everybody's conversations are being recorded, you get jokes on late night TV and life goes back to how it was. That, I think, is almost insurmountable. I don't know how we change the behaviour of the general public. I just don't. And it's fine for the people here. We can run our own servers. We can host our own services. We can use pump.io and IRC and XMPP. But everybody else will be on Facebook Messenger. And too bad. And we can try to force people to change by law and by regulation. But that would undo so much of the web as it exists today that it seems inconceivable we would have that change. I'm all for radical reform. I think that, that making conscious choices about that is a great way to approach the world. And that if we did so, we would realise, for example, that long copyright terms are not conducive to innovation. But that kind of radical change, I don't think has ever happened in the world. Even genuine violent revolution has never imposed that kind of change instantaneously. We have to find some progressive route to change. And I don't know what that route is. I don't know how we go from the place we are now to a place where we have that degree of decentralisation. There are some great proposals. You know, things like MailPile. Oh, you can run your own email server on a Raspberry Pi that sits on top of your router. That's a great proposal. But email's hard. <laughs> and running your own mail server is hard. And how long do you think it takes? How many missed messages does it take before people say, I'll just use Gmail? And, and that's the problem, is that there's no easy path forward. There's no migration path that everyday individuals can take. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was really hopeful after Pierre's keynote. I was really excited about the prospect of choosing the future that we want and building that future now. And I think that it is still worth doing. It is still worth the people in this room building the tools and deploying the tools and teaching others how to use the tools and making sure that that freedom exists for the people who are sufficiently privileged to exercise it. But for the world as a whole, for the 7 billion people, or the you know, 6.99 billion people who don't use Linux on the desktop, I, I don't know how we solve that for them. Um, and that's the end of my talk. Absolutely brilliant, thought-provoking talk. I think you're going to keep us guessing and keep us, keep us up at night thinking about how we solved that one. We do have time for some questions. Do we have any questions from the audience? Great.
Uh, thanks for that talk. Uh, I thought I was a pessimist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you talked about, you, you said that um, you see that it's going to be a real problem getting consumers or kind of the general public to do these things. Well, we're here at a conference that's in a room of producers. Do you think that it would be possible to maybe change the behavior of producers? People that are producing software, producing laws, to make them more ethical for um, towards privacy. Sure, and I mean we can produce federated protocols, and we can produce software that is open and that permits this type of activity. And maybe over enough time, we can get enough adoption of that. But I think uh, that's going to be really hard. And it's going to require decisions to be made contrary to the commercial interests of big players. It's going to require decisions to be made contrary to the interests of government. Um, it's hard to convince people to do those things. And I do think it's important and valuable work. And the more that we can do that, the more that we can say, hey, we will be respecting these rights in the things that we do, the better the world will be. But uh, it's one thing for us to say we're going to respect this because we think it's a good thing and we're the people in charge. That's different from saying individuals have rights that must be protected. And I think that idea that individual rights are, are paramount just is no longer true. Or, or that this individual right is paramount is no longer true. Uh, shortly after the Snowden revelations, there was an uh, Occupy Wall Street, and uh, during that there were, I, I did see uh, through the movie Citizen 4, there was at least one talk uh, relating to uh, warning people of uh, metadata tracking. Uh, since then, had, uh, have, what changes have you seen for better or worse? Look, I think the biggest uh, change has been the adoption of end-to-end -end encryption, and we've seen much more of that. You know, the adoption by WhatsApp of end-to-end -end encryption is a fantastic um, a change. Door. Pardon? It has a back door. Uh, some say it has a back door. Others say that it just uh, doesn't, you know, give you information about key changes and whether that's a different thing is uh, up for debate. But look, it's, it's definitely far from perfect, um, but as is GPG. Uh, so, look, we have seen a move towards protection of communications per se, encryption on the wire becoming uh, the default even within data centres or between data centres among uh, major service providers, end-to-end uh, -end encryption being a priority for a lot of large organisations. Uh, but I think metadata is, is still a, an enormous problem, and I don't think that we've seen any real change in the approach there. I don't think we have to do all the technology ourselves since the Snowden revelations and things like that. A rather big smartphone manufacturer has gone out of their way to piss off their government and keep data on the phones private. Your example about GPS history is nice, but we don't have to put up with what's available at the moment. We just have to get enough people to ask for services that respect our privacy, and somebody will realise there's money in it and provide them. Yeah, and oh, sorry, that wasn't a question. That wasn't a question. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's okay. Chris isn't to, here. To, to phrase that follow-up question, what do you think about? <laughs> I, th I think you're right, that we can see increasing respect for those things as it becomes a valuable commercial service. And there are companies like Fastmail that have made it their business to say, we're not going to use the ad-funded revenue route, we're going to use the person-funded revenue route. And they've been very successful, and that's fantastic. But that's the provision of privacy as a service. That's not the respect of a right to privacy. Um, and I'll also note that app.net just shut down, so whatever that means. Uh, thanks for the shout out to Fastmail. Uh, I was actually going to go entirely the other direction as a devil's advocate. The reality is, this is the world we're living in. It's only going to become easier to correlate data sets, easier to track people individually. Computers are getting more and more powerful. In that reality, is it better to work out how we're going to navigate that reality rather than pretending it's not coming? Uh, I, I, I do think there's a lot of value in that, and a lot of value in, in uh, teaching people to think like uh, 90s crypto nerds. Um, if people are aware of the way their information is being collected and tracked and used, then people may choose to make a conscious decision about how they do that. And I, I, as I say, I make that decision. I've made the decision to permit Google location tracking, but I also have a fast mail account. Um, I have a published GPG key. Um, 
uh, and I encrypt my hard drive, but I'm okay with the types of metadata collection that I know are going on, and I know that if I want to stop being okay with that, I go out without my phone. Um, if the general public is aware of that, then maybe they can make those conscious choices. I think the, the big part of the problem is, as I was saying, the consent isn't really there. People aren't aware of these things, and it's very hard to make them aware. Um, and even with Snowden revelations, I think people didn't understand the impact of what was coming out there. Um, Michael, there's a great quote from the American investigative journalist, Izzy Stone, that I think you know, definitely helped me sleep at night, that the type of investigative journalism he did is about losing and losing and losing and losing and possibly dying and still losing so that one day someone in the future can have that win and overcome that. But, yeah, that helps me sleep. But um, on that idea of practical change, are there some projects that you could point people here to that we could contribute to or be using aside from fast and stuff like that that could make a practical difference or you think are doing a good job? Look, I, I think there are a lot of great projects that people have been moving further and further away from. Um, Diaspora, great idea, decentralised social networking. I don't know if there are still running Diaspora servers anywhere out there, probably, but maybe they haven't been patched in two years because no one's touched them. Um, I think that is... I, I think the thing we need to do is be thinking about that from a policy perspective and from a big service perspective. It's much more impactful when WhatsApp decides to enable end-to-end -end encryption, even if it is flawed, than it is for someone to say, hey, I've got this great you know, distributed blockchain-based chat system, why don't we all just use that instead? Um, I think the most important push is for federation. That's what enables decentralization. And the movement away from federation, um, I don't want to be mean to Google, but like removing XMPP support from Hangouts, uh, like, and never enabling federation in XMPP and Hangouts, um, I think was really harmful to that ecosystem. Signal refusing to create a federated protocol is really harmful to that ecosystem because the things that make our best communication mediums work is the fact that you can go from anyone to anyone. Telephone, SMS, email, it doesn't matter what your server is, what your client is, there's a federated protocol. Um, I would like to see more of that. Michael, uh, you were talking about um, the um, trade-off between disclosing particular personal data to a service provider um, for them to provide a service um, against the value of that service to you services, you're like, yep, I've turned it on um, and I've made an informed choice to do that. Most people haven't. Um, my question is about, what about all the other data that service providers are often collecting that isn't actually needed um, to provide that service? How do we get greater exposure around that issue and how can we lean on service providers to not collect, for example, my SIM ID, my international mobile subscriber ID, um, you know, whether or not my operating system is rooted and this sort of stuff? Uh, good question. <laughs> um, I, look, I think uh, the law always provides you should only collect the information that is required for your service. Um, what that means in a technical context is very poorly understood by anyone. Uh, people say, oh, this is great, we need what we would like to do is no, uh, you know, install attribution on mobile apps, so we'll collect an IMSI in order to do that, um, or you know, Google Ad ID or whatever the, the newer systems are. But uh, I, the, the problem is that people are thinking about these things piecemeal, and that the real danger comes from the bulk of information. Um, I don't know how we change people's focus uh, so that they, they care about the big picture when they're making a decision about whether to collect a UA ID or not. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a good answer, but good question. <laughs> In fact, they've all been very good questions. Thank you for such a great range of questions. On behalf of Linux Conference, I have a small token to give to Michael for his excellent talk. Thank you, Cathy. Session, we have David Bell talking digital legacy, business process continuity and disaster recovery. So that's up next in this room. <laughs>